200 plus acres and it's one of the largest actually uh, in the US and uh, uh, from there they have preachers and they do a lot of devotion programs. Swami Nikolai Thank you. Thank you. So I've been asked to give a little introduction to Hinduism. I guess a little bit longer than an elevator speech, which would be 30 seconds. It's more like the, uh, you have a 10 minute cab ride to the airport and the cabbie asks you, so what is Hinduism? So in 10 minutes or less, here's a brief introduction to the ideas of Hinduism, just to give you some general understanding what is Hinduism and uh, what is its philosophy? There's a lot of misconceptions about Hinduism out there, so I'll take you back to the source and uh, present a few of the general concepts of Hinduism. Of course, since Hinduism is a religion, it's about God. And one of the biggest misconceptions, probably the first and foremost misconception about Hinduism if you open Encyclopedia Britannica and read, what will the first line say? Hinduism is a polytheistic religion. So it couldn't be farther from the truth. There's our main, uh, you can say the original authority amongst all the Hindu scriptures is called Ved or the Vedas, which includes the Upanishads. So there's a, several statements. One says, Eko Deva. I'll sing the whole verse for you. Eko Deva Sarva Bhuteshu Buddha Sarva Vyapi Sarva Bhutantaratma Karma Dhyaksha Sarva Loka Dhivasa Sakchi Cheta Kevalo Nirgunascha so this starts by saying Eka. Eka means one. Deva. Dev means God. There's only one God. Eko Deva. Sarva Bhuteshu Gurha. That one single God resides in the heart of every living being. Sarva Bhutantaratma is described as the soul of all the souls. We're all souls, but there's one supreme soul. Soul means the one who gives life to your body. So your soul is inside your physical body, giving life to it, but God is inside your soul, giving life to your soul. Karma dhyaksha. There's a word karma. In the West, people normally say karma. It's pronounced karma. Is karma dhyaksha. It means he's observing all of our actions. And he remembers them. And then he also gives us the consequences, good or bad. Sarva Loka Divasa, it means the whole world, whatever exists, exists within him. There can be nothing outside of him. And Cheta, he's alive, he's conscious, just like we're conscious. He's not a non living energy, he's actually a divine entity. And he's defined as divine knowledge and divine bliss. You can say bliss personified, knowledge personified. That is God. Ekameva dvitiyam brahma nehana anasti kinchan. Another statement from the Vedas that says there's only one God. In fact, it says it three different ways. Ekam means there's only one. Advitiya, there's not two. <laughs> there's nothing else means there's only God so there's only one God now let me share something with you that all Hindus firmly believe it's not just uh, something we say to be politically correct but we actually firmly believe it that there really is only one God for the entire universe for all souls so Hindus actually believe that we're not, as Hindus, worshipping a Hindu god. And then Jews are worshipping their Jewish god, and Christians are worshipping their Christian god. 
we actually believe that there's only one God and we're all worshiping Him in our own way. We all relate to Him in our own way and approach Him in our own way. And this year actually marks the 150th anniversary of the birth of a very prominent Hindu personality who was the first prominent individual to bring that message to the West. Many of you would have heard of Swami Vivekanandji. So in 1893, he came to the West, he came to Chicago for the World Parliament of Religions. And it was something like this, but on a much, much larger scale, and many other religions were represented, and everybody was getting a chance to speak. When Swami Vivekanandji began his uh, discourse, he began by saying, brothers and sisters, meaning, as the Vedas say, we're all, every soul is a son or daughter of God. So we're literally all brothers and sisters. He said brothers and sisters. And then he delivered his message of harmony of religions, that there's nothing innate in any religion that, that would prevent us from accepting other religions. Uh, if there are people using religion as an excuse uh, to be intolerant towards others, then you can say that's a, a perversion of, of what the religion is supposed to be. But there's an actually no reason why everybody can't say, okay, in your religion you call God by this name, and you describe him as having these characteristics and, and you have this history of worshipping him and you follow that tradition and you worship him through certain rituals and in our religion we worship the same God but we have a slightly different tradition, a slightly different history of how we've worshipped him but I'll respect your traditions and you respect mine and we'll both understand that we're worshipping the very same God. So that's one of my favorite tenets of Hindu religion. I'll share just a couple more ideas with you to give you a little bit of a well-rounded picture of Hinduism. I mentioned karma. You know, after Swami Vivekananji came in 1893, that kind of began the influx of Hindu philosophy, which gradually kind of trickled down into the West. Before even many Indians started immigrating, I think probably it was until the 1970s until really great numbers of Indians started coming and uh, entering America. But well before that, ideas like karma and reincarnation and meditation and yoga had found their way to America. So karma is very similar to Newton's law. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So we think of every action, and keep in mind, action doesn't just mean the motions of my physical body, it also means my words, and it even includes my thoughts, which is a little scary. Because God is keeping track of all of our karma, and He's keeping track of it and categorizing it according to what is the motivation behind those actions. Is it good? Is it bad, or is it somewhere in between? Every action is categorized. Every thought is categorized. And then we receive the result in the future. So good actions lead to some kind of prosperity and well-being, and bad actions are causing suffering to others on purpose. That leads, leads to some kind of personal hardship in the future. Of course, you're probably aware that Hinduism teaches that the future does not only include this life, but any future incarnations that we may have, because as souls, we're all eternal, and if we don't reach our ultimate goal in this life, we'll come back and try again. So the good and bad luck of this life that I'm having, that's the result of my previous lifetimes, good and bad karma, that's what we believe. And all of this is being governed by God. So if we want to have more well-being and prosperity, we have to plant good seeds. Every action is like a seed that we plant, and then that seed sprouts sometime in the future. And although people sometimes blame God, that, uh, oh God, how could you let this happen to me? 
How could you let this happen to my family? Well, God's answer, if we could talk to him directly, would be, well, if you didn't want a cactus to grow, why did you plant the cactus seed? If you desired a nice, fragrant, flowering bush, you should have planted that kind of seed. This is the law of karma. And along with that, we teach our children, and we're meant to remember ourselves, that God is always with us and always watching and keeping track. So just like if someone thinks he's alone going somewhere and uh, he sees a hundred dollar bill lying on the ground, the great majority of people would probably just slip that into their pocket and keep walking. But if there's even one other person watching them, they'll say, oh, did anybody drop a hundred dollar bill? Out of the fear of even an ordinary human being, we save ourselves from doing many wrong things. Yet we forget that God is watching, even if no one else is watching, God is watching. So we try to remember that in Hinduism. There's a, a saying, Tasmat sarveshu kaleshu It's from the Gita, where God says, Remember me every single moment of the day. Why? Because, for one thing, I am with you, so why would you forget me? And for the second, if you forget me, that's when you're bound to do things that you're going to later regret. And if you remember God, then we're much more likely to do good things other than bad things. And the final thing I want to share with you regarding Hinduism is that although even within Hinduism, there are dozens and dozens of types of meditation. Hindus also use meditation as a method of heart purification, which is done by attaching the mind to God or remembering God, sitting in meditation and trying to think of God and deeply absorb the mind in remembering God. And since God is divine and you're creating a connection between you and God, that purifies your mind or purifies your heart and develops your good qualities of your mind. The more pure the mind becomes, the more those good qualities in our character manifest. And the more impure the mind becomes through negative thinking or wrong actions, the more the negative qualities of a person's personality are likely to manifest. So we actually try to purify our mind and develop our spiritual potential by thinking of God and meditating on God. This is also called devotion or worship. Although there are many kinds of worship, this is the internal kind of worship that can go along with any kind of external type of worship that you might see if you came to a Hindu temple. So that's my uh, taxi ride speech to you on what is Hinduism. And uh, I'll be around after, so if anyone has any specific questions, I'll be happy to talk to you. Namaskar.